So uh, we've been looking for many weeks at uh, Christian giving. It's actually when I went back and looked at it, it's been nearly a month since we since we've discussed this topic. Um, I had been back in between, but we the Lord directed our hearts somewhere else, and so uh, I just wanted to quickly sort of refresh our minds on where we were. Um, we've been looking at Christian giving. We talked about. Uh, you know, we compared the tithe in the Old Testament and, and uh, we looked at the New Testament, some examples of giving. And, and then we asked the question, well, how was this giving used? We established very clearly that the New Testament was marked by a giving heart of the believers, uh, a giving to, to the church, and then provision was made uh, as was necessary. And so how was it used? We looked at some specific examples of that. Uh, we saw, first of all, that it was used to assist those in need in order to pro provide for equality in the church. And we saw examples of where the poor were assisted, where the weak were assisted, where widows were assisted. Um, and so we, I wanted to just read this passage to you again in 2 Corinthians 8.13 to remind you of that thought. Uh, it says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened, as Paul is writing to them concerning this gift that they had promised for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem. He says, But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. And so there was uh, a striving for equality there among the saints. We'll see that again in Acts chapter 4. Uh, in the early church. Here's the church in its infancy and what was their practice and pattern in Acts 4 and verse number 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. And why was that? For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of those things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So there was a heart for the needs of those that were among them. And there was a care for those that were lacking. There was a concern for those that uh, did not have. It wasn't this pattern, you know, like, we, like James talked about when the brother comes to you that's naked or hungry and you said, hey, I'm going to be praying for you. Be you warmed and filled. And you you send them away, right? There was a heart. They're going to provide that meal. They're going to provide that clo those clothes according to the need. And so uh, there was, number one, these, uh, these funds were used to assist those in need uh, within the church. And we saw that as we looked at it, that there was specifically an emphasis upon the church. Uh, and we were reminded of that verse in Galatians that as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, but especially they that are of the household of faith. And we saw that to be a pattern in the New Testament church. Uh, what we looked at last time, number two, uh, it was used for remuneration for those laboring in the Word. And we'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in verse number, beginning in verse number 5, as uh, the Apostle writes to the uh, church in Corinth, and we've, we kind of labored, we spent some time in this to, uh, to hopefully clear up why it was that Paul said he wasn't taking anything from the Corinthian church, but he wasn't saying that that's not the way that it, uh, that that was the way that it should have been. There was an issue there within the uh, church at Corinth where uh, Paul was certainly undervalued by them, and uh, there were false apostles that were coming in among them, and Paul said, I'm going to make a clear distinction between me and them, and that thereafter you're stuff. And I'm going to make it clear that I'm not. He said, I robbed other churches in order to minister to you, taking wages of them. But here's what he says in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and verse number 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, Peter? Or is it just me and Barnabas, right? Is it, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith the law? Saith not the law the same also? And by the way, uh, he, so he quotes this in the law. And one thing that we saw in each of these, and we're going to see it in the point today, is that God's heart hasn't changed, right? 
He was concerned for the poor among the church in the Old Testament, just like he was in the New. He was concerned for providing for those that were laboring in the Word in the Old Testament, just like he was in the New. So this is a pattern, and the apostle reaches back to the Old and says, this is the same uh, way God was in, in, in the law and in the Old Testament age. For it is written... Um, for it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should he be partaker of his hope. It would make no sense that a farmer plow and plant his field and not expect to receive of the crop that comes forth, right? If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And I, so I highlight that again. He reaches back to the Old Testament to establish a pattern that he says still applies here in the New. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar, right? They, those tithes that came in, that provided food for those that labored there in the temple and in the tabernacle. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And so one of the ways that, the, that these funds were used was remuneration for those laboring in the word, providing for these that faithfully labored in the word uh, so that they might be able to focus on that. And, and I, was, I was thinking about that. God brought Acts chapter 6 to mind. What, the whole basis for choosing the deacons there, right, was that Peter said, it's not fit that we apostles should leave the prayer and the study of the Word and serve tables. Choose you out faithful men full of the Holy Ghost to do that so that we can give ourselves to prayer and to the Word. It's, it's not, it is not reason was the word that Peter used there. It means it's not fit. It makes no sense that they should serve tables instead. Peter said it's best for you, church, if we're able to focus on the Word, right? It's best for you if we're able to give ourselves fully to that and not be distracted by these other things. And so that was part of the purpose of those uh, resources that were coming in. I told you 3 John 1 through 8, we won't for time's sake go there today, but that's a, another good passage that uh, sets that forth how he encourages them to take care of these men that are laboring in the Word as they were passing through, uh, take care of them after a godly sort. And if you'll look that up in some other translations in the Treasury Scripture of Knowledge, you'll see that it means take care of them in a manner worthy of God, right? Uh, esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And then thirdly, the last thing that I wanted to look at today as I was, as I was considering this, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, the whole reason that we're looking at this is we're trying to understand uh, order within the church. Do all things decently and in order. And so I, I'm looking at the things that we typically do. What's our common practices? And do we have biblical basis for that? Well, there are certain things that we use the funds that come in for that don't really fall in these two categories. And they're just things that are necessity. They're necessary things that we have to take care of. In other words, we're meeting here. It's raining outside today. It'd be kind of dark in here if we didn't have electricity, wouldn't it? We, we're, we pay an electric bill. Right? There are things that are necessary to, to be able to keep up the building that we meet in. There are things that are just necessary as the church meets, meets together. Necessary things. What about that? And so uh, I want to go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Do we see any examples of that in the New Testament church? In Romans chapter 12, there is a, there's a general word that's used here. And I would suggest that it's a word that, that can be applied to all of these things. In uh, Romans chapter 12 and in verse number, uh, we'll back up a little bit, verse number uh, 10, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the what of saints? The necessity of saints. And this is my point. There are just things that are necessary, right? There are necessary things as the saints gather together, distributing to the necessity of saints. Now, I don't doubt that, that, that there's a special emphasis there on that which we talked about at the beginning, our first point, providing for those that were in need. But my, I wanted to emphasize that word necessity. There are some things that of a necessity just need to be taken care of. And he says, given to hospitality also. Um, flip over to John chapter 13. There are expenses that arise as believers come together. There are things that are necessary to be taken care of. 
But I will say this. He calls it necessities, right? And to me, that emphasizes the way that we ought to scrutinize how those funds are used, right? Which things are really necessary? We're not talking about over and, and, and abundant uh, beyond, right, the things that are necessary. These things ought to be scrutinized because what is the purpose of the church? You shall be witnesses unto me, Jesus Christ said, right? Our purpose is to be a witness to Jesus Christ, and we do that through declaring the Word of God. And so when we're examining the way the things that the church ought to be about, that's got to be the emphasis. How do we declare the Word of God? There are, there are a lot of things in here that we don't have that you'll find in other churches, and why is that? Because we want the emphasis to be on Jesus Christ. We want the emphasis to be on sending the Word of God forth, right? We don't need the giant cathedrals. Because that would take away from what we're able to do as the Word of God goes forth. And so there needs to be an emphasis on that. These are necessities. That To me, the strength of that word highlights the manner in which the, these expenses, these spend, this spending should be scrutinized. We need to be obedient to God and being witnesses to Jesus Christ through the faithful declaration of the Word of God. Look at, at John chapter 13. Uh, and so we ask, does a certain expense support that? Uh, you know, I would argue that it, that it does support it that we have uh, electricity in here so that we can declare the Word of God, so that we can record the messages and be able to put them online. We have to pay every month for hosting, you know, when we put these sermons up on websites so that people all over the world can hear it. There are certain things that are necessary in order to uh, send the word of gospel of, of uh, the word of God's gospel forth. John 13 and verse number uh, 29. You, we're very familiar with this passage here. Uh, you know, Jesus gives Judas Iscariot the sop, um, and you know they're all wondering who it is that's going to betray him, and nobody really understands it when Jesus said, "That thou doest, do quickly." In verse 27, no one knew why he spake this, but what did they think? Maybe was the reason why. That's what I want to look at in verse number 29 because the things that they think here, the reason that they're thinking this is because these are common things that they've done before. All right? So verse 29, why did Jesus tell Judas that? Judas is the one that had the bag, right? He carried the funds. He was the treasurer for this, this group of believers. And it says, For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast. What are we talking about? We're talking about necessary things, right? We're, talk we're talking about things that as the church gathers together and we do those things that God has called us to do. You know, we participate in, in the Lord's Supper, in communion. Well, you, we got to buy the, the juice and the wafers for that, right? I mean, that's just simple, necessary things that have to be taken care of as we do that. There was, a, there was a, this feast as they were obedient to the Lord and doing what God had said, and we got to buy those things that are necessary for that. So that, they thought, well, that's maybe what he's telling them to do because he's told them to do that before, right? What's another thing? Or that he should give something to the poor. That was a common practice among them. And so they, these were two things that came to their mind that maybe that's what he was telling Judas to do because this is way that we, a way that we've used the funds in the past. Does that make sense? Um, and so this was how the disciples were expecting uh, possibly those funds to be used, those things that we have need of. Again, there's that word need there, much like that word necessities that we saw Previously, Well, let's go back to the New Testament. Do we see, see the same, I'm sorry, the Old Testament. Do we see the same pattern there like we did with the other two things? Look at Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. And verse number 1. Leviticus 24. And verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. One of the things that's going to have to happen if this lamp is going to burn continually is that we're going to need oil, right? It's like we were talking about with communion. You've got to have the juice and the wafers, right? The oil needed to, was a necessary part of that. And so part of the, the tithing that the children of Israel did was to provide for this oil. It was just a necessary thing so that the lamp was continually burning. One of these necessary things, it, it almost goes without saying, I think. Uh, look at Numbers 18. Numbers 18. 
in that Old Testament tabernacle. And you know what? There were a lot of things that just had to be taken care of. There were a lot of things that needed to be done in order for that tabernacle, tabernacle to function and to run efficiently. And in Numbers 18, the Lord, uh, verse number 1, said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of the priesthood. But God said there's a lot of stuff outside of just the priesthood that needs to be taken care of. And so what did God provide for that? And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. But thou, uh, but thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. And they shall keep thy charge and the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary of the altar that neither they nor ye also die. And they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle and a stranger shall not come nigh unto thee. So there was this whole entire tribe of Levi that wasn't part of the priesthood, but they were responsible for keeping the tabernacle up and running. Right? When the temple was established, they would have been responsible for keeping the temple up and running. How were these men provided for? Look down in verse number 21. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithe in Israel. They were provided for through those tithes, through those things that, the, that Israel brought in as an offering to the Lord. He provided for these that were assisting in these necessary things in the tabernacle. Uh, all the tithe of, in Israel for an inheritance, for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And so, you know, something breaks around here and somebody's got to fix it, right? And what do you do? Well, you, you pay for that. Right? That's the way that it works. Those are just necessary things that need to be taken care of. That type of repair, we see that in 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. In 2 Kings 22 and in verse number... In verse number 3, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of uh, Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work uh, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair, repair the breaches of the house, and to carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. So they took up funds from among the people here to repair the house of the Lord, to care, to take care of these natural necessities. What do I want to say about all that? That you're going to find significantly less about this third topic than you do the first two. I gave you two verses in the entire New Testament that I could find that was related to that. And that first one you might say is, is kind of, maybe that applies to the poor. But I just wanted to read that word necessities. There are necessities that come up as a result of that. There's so very little about this. And, and like I said, maybe it's because it just goes without saying that, well, we have to take care of these things. But I think the emphasis, uh, the reason that there is so little is because the emphasis is not upon material needs. The emphasis is on spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the emphasis. The emphasis is on spreading the word of God. And so the church doesn't require an $18 million crystal cathedral in order to do that. Right? I just looked that up. I didn't know that off the top of my head. How much that crystal cathedral cost. Did you know, by the way, they went bankrupt and now the, uh, there's a Catholic church that meets there? So that group doesn't exist and own that building anymore. $18 million for a crystal cathedral. Maybe the church doesn't need that, right? The church ought to function in natural things in as lean as a manner as possible that the ministry God has called her to not be lacking. Solomon built a grand temple to the Lord. And uh, do we, let's see, let me see if we have time to read these verses. Just uh, He built a glorious temple to the Lord. When you got time, go back and look at 2 Chronicles 2 to see what... <laughs> Solomon had to say about that, though. Um, and Stephen kind of emphasizes the same point, so we'll go to what Stephen says in Acts chapter 7. Solomon understood when he built this, as he was preparing to build this grand temple to the Lord, that this is not sufficient, right? My temple can't contain my God, right? Uh, God is greater than this temple. This is, this is a tiny, small thing compared to our God. And so if we build our crystal temples to our God, 
then and say this is where our God lives and this is where our God dwells with us we've just embraced every other religion of the world that builds their temples their glorious temples to their gods our God's not like that in Acts 7 and verse number 48 uh, Stephen really exposes uh, the fact that the Jews were focusing on things like the temple, these natural things. There was an overemphasis on material things and they were glorying in these material things. We remember the disciples even when they saw Herod's temple there, they were like, they were admiring it. Look at this glorious temple and all Jesus had to say about it is there's not going to be one stone left upon another here. You want to glory in that? It's going away. That glory is fading. Let's talk about a glory that's everlasting. All right? And so Acts 7 and verse number 48, as Stephen is preaching here just before they kill him, they didn't like him messing with their crystal cathedral. But Solomon built him in house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? God says, hasn't my hand made all these things? You can't build me anything that declares my glory. The work of man's hands always falls short, right? That's the basic premise of the gospel. You can't do enough with your hands to satisfy God. And so we can't build a temple grand enough to declare the glory of God. No matter how grand we build it, guess what? It always falls short. It always falls short. And so what does it look like to the world when you build a crystal cathedral and then that church goes bankrupt? Was that for God's glory? Does that exalt God and His glory? Only in the sense that, that those people are exposed for what they are. That they're just like the Jews here, glorying in material things rather than glorying in the God who made all things. And like I said, we know they didn't like that message very much and they killed Him after He preached it. But Paul says a similar thing when he's on Mars Hill in Acts 17. And in verse 24, and as he's walking through Athens, what is he seeing? He's seeing temple after temple after temple built to false gods. He's seeing idols all over the place. He's seeing statues here and there. It's just full of idolatry. He says, I want to tell you about the God that's not like any of these other gods. You can't build any grand temple to contain this God. Acts 17 and verse 24 God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things. He said it's just the opposite. He doesn't need us to build Him a grand temple. We need Him. God doesn't need us. We need Him. That's the God that I declare to you, Paul said. He's the God that would bust out of any of these temples if He, if he stepped into it. Your temples can't contain. God is bigger than that. You know what God's temple is? God's temple is this weak church. Body of believers, right? Uh, among whom He says there's not many mighty. There's not many noble. There aren't many wise. In the eyes of the world, it's a bunch of foolish things. A bunch of weak things. A bunch of base things. God says that's the temple that I will inhabit. You know why God does it that way? What does the rest of that passage there in the Corinthian letter say? That no flesh should glory in His presence. So that when the world sees this weak and despised and foolish church and sees her standing when everyone around her is falling, they say, that's got to be God. Because those people don't really amount to much. There's not much to them, but wow, there must be something to their God. And God gets the glory for that. No flesh should glory in His presence. Our God works through and lives in them, in His church. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost, church.